modern day Germany, you can see the borders next to Poland. The very interesting part is the situation of Berlin. People, a lot of people don't realize how far over the east of Germany that Berlin is, which also starts to explain a little bit of the relevance, the Second World War, the obsession with states securing up their borders. Just to go through some key dates for you, and I don't want to bamboozle you, but very simply, Berlin was founded late 12th century, two small villages on either side of the Spray River. It was a marshy swamp area. It was an easy river crossing. And so these two small settlements founded and they joined together to form the one city which became known as Berlin in 1307. During the 30 years war, uh, Berlin was devastated. Uh, however, one of the results of the 30, after the 30 years war, there was the Edict of Potsdam, which actually opened up Berlin. They were trying to invite people, encourage people to come and live in Berlin. And so they passed the law of religious tolerance. And by 1700, they estimate that 20% of the population of Berlin were French and actually French Huguenots. Rather ironic, considering what happened during the Nazi period, that Berlin was seen as this racial, to tolerating um, different religions very fairly by 1700. 1871, Prussia had become a powerful state and had, they had the Franco-Prussian War, Bismarck managed to unify all of Germany after the Franco-Prussian War and founded an imperial capital because Germany from 1871 through to 1918 was an imperial power. It had an empire stretching around the globe, had a navy second only to the British Navy. It, it was an imperial power. Obviously, First World War ended. There was a chaotic six months, the end of 1918 into 1919. You had a couple of revolutions, a couple of different republics uh, announced. But by the middle of 1919, you had the Weimar Republic. And this is sort of considered by a lot of people as the Camelot moment of Berlin modern history. By 1933, Camelot came to an end and you had uh, Hitler come into power as the Reich Chancellor. Just a, an idea of where Prussia was, this is just leading up to the 1871 um, Franco-Prussian War, this quite powerful nation state and with Berlin as its uh, capital there, so Berlin here in the centre, um, Prussia stretching across the top of what we now know we call Germany today. Nazis come to power, 1936, the Summer Olympics, which actually was the model for all future Summer Olympics from then on. It was the first multimedia Olympics. The torch relay, it was devised and used for the first time for the Berlin Summer Olympics. Anyway. Second World War comes along, 1945, the Battle of Berlin, the Soviets destroy Berlin effectively, first half of 1945. And after the end of the Second World War, the four Allied powers occupy Berlin. So you have France, Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union occupying Germany, and then also occupying Berlin. In 1949, there was the division of Germany. So France, Britain, and the United States gave independence to the Federal Republic of Germany and they made Bonn the capital and then the Soviet Union set up the German Democratic Republic which is East Germany and they made Berlin well technically East Berlin their capital. I'll just show you very quickly uh, an image here showing you that you obviously got the West Berlin with Bonn over here as the capital and then East Germany and Berlin over here in the far east. But Berlin itself was a divided city because the four allied powers kept control of the city. So West Berlin was controlled by France, Britain and the United States and East Berlin controlled by the Soviet Union and what was later the East German government. Um, 1953 there was workers uprising in East Berlin, which was quickly squashed by the Soviet Union. 1961, this divided city, the East Germans started to build the wall around the West Berlin city and in basically enclosing it because the city itself was completely surrounded by East Germany anyway. Uh, you had 1948, the famous blockade and the airlift going through, but 61 where they actually formalized it and built a wall around the city. 9th of November 1989, quite an amazing, and most of us probably uh, remember this momentous occasion when the wall came down. It was a bit of a bureaucratic schmozzle, and it's worth watching the video of the announcement. It was a real 
bureaucratic nightmare. Um, a bit of a mistake that was made that night, but people were free to cross between the two cities for the first time since 1961. 1990, the unification of Germany and the new Federal Republic of Germany. And 1991, Berlin became the capital of the new unified Germany. So that's very quickly the Reader's Digest version of the history of Berlin. And now I'd like, love to cross over to Tom and take us away, Tom. Well, perfect. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and the exposition of Berlin's history. On my own behalf, welcome to our exploration of Berlin. Here mm -hmm. we're in the late morning on a beautiful blue, sunny, rather hot day. And as Stu has suggested, we would like to take our time to explore the communication, the expression of the layers of history of Berlin that are really, particularly in the 20th century, a microcosm of well, world history, really, in this 20th century, without, however, failing to look into the 19th century, the 18th century periods as well, and how those layers are visualized for us to this day. And what an appropriate place to begin here at what is called Museum Island. A bit more on that in just a minute. At the Berlin Cathedral. Behind me, you notice this really rather extraordinary monumental building that was intentionally designed to look much older than it is. The building dates from 1905 and it was the official church of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And Kaiser, or Emperor Wilhelm II, had a cultural and architectural and artistic policy that always said, use historical forms, in this case the Baroque and the Renaissance, to give a legitimacy to our very youthful empire, which, as Stu suggested, is created in 1871. So we notice that the buildings of this imperial Germany tend to be a little bit monumental, one could argue pompous, rather truncated, very heavily decorated, often utilizing a dome. But the Berlin Cathedral, which sort of creates a, a, a dominant position at Museum Island, is in close proximity to the first museum island on, uh, to the first museum building on Museum Island. This beautiful classical building from 1830 it is the first of the museum buildings on Museum Island, hence its name, the Old Museum, developed by the Prussian architect Karl Friedrich Schinkel, who is so pivotal to a remodeling of Berlin post-Napoleon. To suggest a Berlin and a Prussia that is not only a kingdom revived after the cataclysmic events of the Napoleonic era, but also a Prussia where knowledge is acquired, is pursued, is preserved, and conserved. Not in a building that is essentially a Greek temple, but a building which is more based upon the lines of an agora, a public meeting space on a plaza in an antique Grecian city. Now, I'm just going to draw your attention to those beautiful colon oh, that beautiful, very elegant colonnade that Chikla has created. And as you look at those columns, you will notice that above the columns, each column there on the Attica is not, there's no Prussian crown, there's no crest of Prussia. There is very little exemplification of royal Prussia in this building, other than the dedication to the king of Prussia. But rather, above each of the columns is an eagle. And the eagle is not a symbolic of the Prussian royal family. It is a symbolic of Prussia as a nation. So all of a sudden we notice that the building is not only communicating that of Russian, uh, Prussian royal power, but also the power and the, the premises of a nation. It begins to communicate a nation. And very typical of Schinkel is the fact that it's set back into the plaza, fair distance, so that there is a procession. That procession is then furthered by that staircase that we see up to the front to the entrance. So creating a sacralization of the art within. Now Museum Island is further developed post-1830. The building that we've just examined is 1830. And ensuing upon that are a series of other buildings, other museum buildings, 
four more. And I believe that Stu will eventually show you an image, a map of Museum Island. There he goes. Yeah. So, so basically, Tom and Katinka started off here just in front of the Berliner Dom and looking at the old museum there. The other, and you obviously see it is an island, both branches of the spray running either side of Museum Island. The first museum at the head of the island, the Bode Museum. Then you have the Pergamon Museum, which has been undergoing, undergoing massive renovations. Um, housed in there is the Pergamon Altar and the Ishtar Gate of Babylon. You then have the new museum, which has Nefertiti's bust. You have the old National Gallery, the old um, art gallery, and then you've got the old Belts Museum, and Tom and Contingo are heading over towards Unter den Linden. Also, just to give you an idea, Tom's not the first one to have traded down through the Lust Garden. There's an image there of a Nazi rally going on with the Alts Museum in the background. Great setting for a rally. Yeah. Perfect. But before we, thank you, Sue, before we proceed down Unter den Linden, let's take a look at one last building on Museum Island. And the building behind me, of which you are now receiving very beautiful images, is the rebuild of the Berlin Palace, the residence of the Prussian kings, the later German emperors. For the most part constructed in the early 18th century, a wonderful example of a Baroque palatial structure, which was actually Europe's largest Baroque palace, much larger than Versailles. Now this palace survived World War II relatively intact, but very sadly, in 1949, with the creation of East Germany as an independent sovereign republic, the leader of East Germany, Walter Ulbricht, ordered the destruction of the palace, arguing that it was too reminiscent, too, too, uh, it carried too much content of a Prussian imperialism and militarism, and it was destroyed. Eventually, in its place, there you see a good image of the palace in its historical viewing. And you will notice that the rebuild, and this is a rebuild, it's really just happening now. Prior to the rebuild, on this position, they, the East Germans created a beautiful parliamentary building, a glass building. Stuart will show you an image in just a minute. And it was the home of the East German parliament. Now, East Germany had a parliament, and you could vote in elections, but you only voted for communist candidates. And, but the Palace of the Republic, from the Berlin Palace to the Palace of the Republic. So uh, uh, maintaining that essence of the Loki, the space, as palatial, but removing us from the royal to the popular, to the people. And there it is. And the Palace of the Republic was actually a rather handsome building, rather authoritarian. But it was beloved by the East Germans. You could go bowling here. There were concert venues. There were theater venues. There was the parliamentary room itself or chamber. So a really rather extraordinary building. But post-1990 and unification, the building had to go. It was simply too, it conveyed too strongly East Germany, a now no longer existing geopolitical entity. And, and so the building is removed by the year 2000. And in its place, they are rebuilding the palace with these beautiful historic facades that we see so nicely. And within the newly rebuilt palace will, will be the sixth museum on Museum Island. And this is called the Humboldt Forum. It is in which the non-Western art and artifacts of, of the uh, collections will be beautifully presented. We are very much looking forward to the opening of the Humboldt Forum, which is scheduled for this December. And as we cross on to Unter den Linden, leaving Museum Island, as Barry said, it really truly is an island on branches of the Spray River. We're crossing by the Palatial Bridge and approaching Unter den Linden itself. Now, as we cross on to Unter den Linden, we will be going by a beautiful building. Tom, Tom, from, sorry, can I just yep. interrupt? I'll, I'll just sure. give everyone a bit of an overview to show, show us the route so they can get a bit of bearing as we go oh, yeah. along. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, Thank you. 
So I'll just you think. So we've started off here on Museum Island, and you can see the Berliner Dom, the new palace, the Humboldt Forum being built. Um, and Tom is walking down Unter den Linden. He just crossed onto it. Uh, we're heading to Bebelplatz, continuing along Unter den Linden to Friedrichstrasse, and continuing on down to the entrance to Unter den Linden, being the Brandenburg Gate. And then we'll come across to in front of the Reichstag building. So that gives you a bit of bearing and idea of the route of the tour today. Over to you, Tom. Great, thanks, Rick. And as we've, we've just come right now on to Unter den Linden, more about that terminology in the course of our walk this evening. And I'm walking by here to the right, this lovely pink-toned building. Katinka is making beautiful images for us. Part of this palatial security process. Now, it's important to bear in mind that the Kingdom of Prussia is established firstly in 1701. It's a youthful kingdom, and there are many who envy it particularly that enormous and beautiful palace. And this requires then an enormous security. And the cannons and the muskets were housed in this lovely building here to now to my right. Katinka's make uh, lovely images of the columns and the decorative element upon the building, the armory. Now, as you look, you will notice that this armory which is today the German History Museum. It loses its function as a security position post-World War I and the uh, abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, or Emperor Wilhelm II. But you know, today is, as I said, the German History Museum. It's a lovely tone of pink. Now, I recognize that pink is probably the last color that we would associate with Berlin. But when you come to Berlin, you will notice there are all sorts of buildings in pink. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you another one. What's up with this Berlin pink? We think of pink as a feminine color. They, in the 18th century, considered pink to be a very masculine color. And this is related to the fact that pink is actually oxidized, it's created via an oxidization of iron. So via that iron, creating a very military, rather masculine iconology. So every element that can be possibly pulled out to suggest power is pulled out, down to the colors themselves. Well, if I have a palace in which a king or later emperor is residing, then I will need a position for my bodyguards. And as we continue down Unter den Linden, I'm just going to turn myself around here and we'll have a beautiful view of, oh, great images now that Katinka has created. Thank you, Katinka. Um, be, oh, look at those beautiful blue skies behind. A, more of a Grecian temple-like building from 1815. This was the bodyguard house, the bodyguard station, the new watch. And as you look at the building, again by Schinkel, this is just immediate after Napoleon, Napoleon's final defeat. And the first building to be created in Berlin after Napoleon is removed is then, again, a symbolic of a newly revived Prussian power in, however, again, this rather humanistic Grecian form. You notice, again, the sacralization of the building, the setting back from the street, creating a procession to the building as well. The... Uh, and that, that's providing for a ceremonial space, a ceremonial plaza where the bodyguard and the uh, change in the guard can occur. Well, again, post-1918, the building loses its function. And it is eventually converted into the German War Memorial, commemorating the soldiers of World War I. It remains a war memorial to this day. However, the memorial itself changing, given the societal circumstances on Unter den Linden. Eventually, Stuart will have an image um, of the East German uh, soldiers in front of what was their war memorial, doing their changing of the guard. There it is. And in 1992, there is a remodeling of the interior. And this is a beautiful image that Kantika has been able to call up with the Pantheon-like lighting and Sue will have a close-up image of 
1992, the rededication of the memorial to all victims of war and tyranny. That, that, is, that oculus is like the, the Pantheon. So just so you are aware, when it rains, it rains onto this Pieta. When it snows, it snows onto the Pieta. And the Pieta, now we have a good image of it. Thank you, Sue. Was a creation of the German artist Kathy Kulwitz, who had died in 1945. She had lost her older son, Peter, in World War I. He was really quite young, and she never, she never really recuperated from that loss. And in 1937, she made for her private self a Pieta. She's an artist, so she does woodcuts, she does sculpture. And that Pieta in 1992 was enlarged considerably to be then the center artistic position of the German National War Memorial. Now, when we think of a Pieta, we think of Michelangelo and the ideal of beauty. But typical of Colvitz is this removal from the ideal to a much greater naturalism. Take a look at the facial features of the mother, her proportional system, um, much more naturalistic. And when this was created, it was quite intentional that there was no uh, pediment to the statue, that it was in absolute contact with the earth. So that this sorrowful mother weeping over her lost son is much more universal. And essentially what Colvitz has done is created a mother earth in pain and in sorrow. So we have we continue to walk down Unterdain Linden and I'm just going to <laughs> wave to Kantika, who's creating beautiful visuals for us. And just behind me is the Humboldt University, more on that in just a minute. And on the other side of the street, on the other side of the boulevard, the lovely state opera, Unter den Linden. But let's cross over. Now, if I were to examine, shall we say, the chronology of Prussian kings, one stands out. And this is the mid 18th century. The very, oh, that's the opera house that Katinka is showing you right now, that beautiful building, also in pink, rather English Palladian in its form. The king that stands out is the mid 18th century Prussian king, and this is Friedrich II, Friedrich the Great. I'm just pressing here the button to get the signal. Um, Friedrich II is synonymous with Friedrich the Great. The and Friedrich the Great, whom we often recognize in, term is, in terms of his military supremacy, comes to the throne at a very young age, and one of the first things he does is begin a remodeling of Unterdain Linden, creating a series of buildings surrounding a plaza that he himself refers to as the Forum Fredericium. So creating a close, uh, uh, well, let's say he appropriates antique Rome for his own iconology. So the form Federico, and he creates four buildings. Um, I'll, I'll first, just share, what were you talking about four buildings? I'll give them a view, an aerial view of the- Oh, perfect, the, the, the perfect. Thing. Okay, so you can go, yeah. And if, oh, where Stuart has his pointer is the state opera Unter den Linden. That was the court opera house of Friedrich II which is said to be the first opera house in the world that is freestanding. Behind it, you notice a lovely building with a beautiful centralized dome. Again, reminiscent of the Pantheon in Rome. And this is the Catholic cathedral, was and is the Catholic cathedral. Now that's quite amazing, as in 1752, when that building opened, there were very few, if any, Catholics in Berlin. But there was religious tolerance. And Friedrich places this building intentionally within his forum in order to communicate that religious tolerance. And that is furthered by the idea of the Pantheon, a temple to all gods. The building, which has this wonderful, yeah, exactly where uh, Stu has his pointer, that lovely building with the convex and concave, that undulating facade was Friedrich's library, one of five. Now, as I like to say, if that were my library, I'd be able to keep up with my reading as well. It would look beautiful in Rome. 
the, the opera house would look beautiful in Great Britain with that English Palladianism. The cathedral, wonderful, pantheon-like. So creating a series of various architectural forms and ideas, creating a very tactile and experiential city. Then there is one last building on the Forum Fredericium. And that building is now, by, there's the opera house, also in pink. And just behind me now, the Humboldt University, which is the fourth building at the Forum. And the Humboldt University began life as the royal, as the official residence of the successor to Friedrich's crown, who is his nephew. That fellow's name is Fat Billy. This is typical Prussia. The crown prince did not grow up in the palace. This is for security reasons. In 1810, the building becomes the Humboldt University, which is the oldest of the three universities in Berlin. 19th century, world famous for philosophy. Every German philosopher, including Karl Marx, is at this university, excluding Goethe and Schiller. 1900, the emphasis changes to science. Albert Einstein is here. Max Planck is here. Lisa Meitner is here. Otto Hahn is here. The list goes on. Today, it's considered one of the great German universities. Now, in 1933, let's go back to the origins of the Third Reich. In 1933, right here on this plaza where Kentik and I are situated, occurred on the 10th of May, the infamous Nazi book burnings. Now, the book burnings are oftentimes misunderstood. The book burnings were not organized by the Humboldt University, as is often suggested. Rather, the book burnings were organized by the Department of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment, which is headed up by Joseph Goebbels. And Goebbels, in a very short period of time, had created a list of 20,000 books, works, plays, manuscripts, poems, whatever, in written. And copies of these condemned writings were thrown into huge bonfires, in the case of Berlin, here on this plaza, in front of the library, what was then and now the law library of Humboldt University. At the same time, these book burnings occurred in every German university town on the 10th of May, 1933. So very much a choreographed event of the Ministry of Public, uh, uh, of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. Now in 1993, the state of Berlin commissioned an Israeli artist by the name of Mika Ullmann. Ullmann has lived much of his adult life in Germany to create a memorial, a commemorative event or phenomena to the book burnings of the 10th of May, 1933. And I have a feeling that we'll have a lot of sun today, and this might be a little bit hard to see, but I also know that Stuart has a beautiful image of the memorial to the book burning events of 1933. I'm standing here, and you notice that there is a glass pane just at my feet. And now Stuart's going to come in with his image, which is actually very helpful. And you notice firstly that this glass pane is level with the ground of Berlin so that the memorial and the, and the city of Berlin are at one level. There's no interruption. It formulates a tapestry of memory. And if you look underneath the glass pane, you will be able to detect that, and it's not hologrammatic, they are there, a series of, it's one square, and on the square walls, on the walls, are, they are lined with empty shelves. Empty shelves that have room on them for 20,000 books, that number that were condemned on that evening. However, when Ullmann does this memorial, and it's quite typical of Third Reich or Holocaust-related memorials, to work into the subterranean, avoided space, he does something that's particularly effective, and he removes us from any experience of books. There are no books, but rather we recognize the shelves without books, and this memorial is called Library. And by so doing, what Ullmann does is he make, he, he he creates a cognition in us of the presence of absence. The presence of that which is not there. The typical of Ullman and other memorials related to these uh, events of the Third Reich and the Holocaust is the fact that we do not have words. There's no words telling us, oh, look over here, look, over, this is what this is all about. Also, there's no enclosure. We haven't come through a fence. We haven't come through a gate. There's no ticket office. Nothing is informing us of what this is. It's totally one with the city itself. So again, there's actually a removal from closure so that it becomes very much part of the fabric of Berlin and beyond. Now, 
this memorial does actually use words. And I noticed there's a group over there. So Katika, should we go over here and take a look at this plaque? On all four sides of the memorial, but some distance from the memorial, are bronze plaques and they're all alike. So north, south, east, west. And here we see them live, but I also know that Stuart has a very beautiful image of these. And these, black, these bronze plaques, all, they're all alike. And on one side, it simply states what I said. On this square on the 10th of May, 1933, National Social Students burned the works of hundreds of authors, philosophers, etc. But the image that Stu has for you, I'll read this in German. I'll read it in English, pardon me. It's simply, it's a statement written in 1820 in the diary of Heinrich Heine. Heinrich Heine in 1820 is a, a German poet of 1820, and he saw his own works being burned in a totally different context. And that evening, he wrote in his diary, that was only a beginning. There will you begin by burning books. You shall end by burning people. And this tragically prophetic statement becomes very much part of the book burning memorial, which perhaps is not related only to the phenomena of burning books, and, uh, but all, and, and of course the ensuing tragedies, but also a world without discussion, a world without communication, a world without ideas. So I would like to remove ourselves from this memorial process and let's continue back up on to Unterdein Linden. And as we proceed down Unterdein Linden, let's take a look. There's a beautiful equestrian statue of Friedrich II, Friedrich the Great, from 1851. But let's take a look at that. And then as we continue down, I'll say a few more words about Unterdein Linden. What does that exactly mean? But let's see if we can get some images of Friedrich II. 1851, riding on his horse down to the palace. It's important to bear, to bear in mind that in the mid-19th century, so again, post-Napoleon, the and a revival of a Prussian ideal and an enlargement, an actual enlargement of the geopolitical entity referred to as Prussia, Stuart showed you that map, that there's all of a sudden a golden age is discovered. The golden age of the 18th century, the golden age of Bach, the golden age of Friedrich II and his military and cultural accomplishments. And very much part of that is this lovely image, there we go, of Friedrich II riding off to his heart, riding down to the palace on his lovely horse, surrounded on the pedestal by his various generals, his various philosophers, court composers, so creating then a the unification of those uh, characteristics and accomplishments of Friedrich. The second, a beautiful example of Berlin classicism in the sculptural form. The appropriately placed, once again, very close to that form, Fredericium, which is now referred to as Babelplatz in honor of a socialist politician of the early 20th century. And this brings us very nicely back onto Unterdein Linden under the Linden trees. Linden is simply German for lime. And all of the trees that we see today lining the boulevard are lime trees. And they're really quite beautiful. And just as a side note, the blossoms create a beautiful bouquet in the spring. So Berlin smells really, really nice in the spring. The, and as Unterdein Linden was laid out in the 1650s, the, the then prince had a cousin of the, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, the Dutch prince gave to his cousin a, a collection of linden trees, of lime trees. Now, lime trees grow very straight. They're very aristocratic in their growth and in their appearance. They create beautiful crowns, meaning the branches of the leaves. Beautiful crowns in this really rather noble formation. However, linden or lime is very malleable. So what they loved to do in the 17th and 18th century was take the tops of the trees lining the street and connect them create bower to create bowers or pergolas or what is referred to as a trellage like a trellis 
And this extended then from the Brandenburg Gate, which commences Unter den Linden, in which direction we are walking, to the palace itself. So that you could literally, as you came into Royal Berlin, via the gate, you were literally Unter den Linden, under the Linden trees. However, if I manipulate the natural phenomena of the trees in that form, then I'm creating architecture, really. I'm creating a tunnel, a corridor. I'm creating a three-dimensional perspective. And a perspective, as we all know, must end at a focus point, a vanishing point. And the vanishing point was the palace itself. So in essence, again, pulling out the stops of the urban environment to suggest a power situation. Tom, and Tom can the, I, sorry, sorry. Tom, sure. can I just ask you a question? We had uh, someone ask a question. Um, obviously, interestingly, an incredibly wide boulevard. It's an incredibly wide street. Was it purposely planned that way? I mean, That's a good question. Thank you for asking that, Stuart. I was going to mention that, in fact. This boulevard has always been this wide, which is another means of doing spatial, sig signify, via space, signifying your relationship to power. Let me just finish this up with these trees. So all of a sudden you have this vanishing point, that is the palace. So that in Berlin, essentially all space vanishes onto a symbol of Prussian power. And this correlates to the width of Unter den Linden itself. Now, if we were to explore the streets of Berlin further and do their measurements, what we would notice is that the parallel streets and plazas become slightly wider and wider the closer they come to Unter den Linden. So that suddenly you are on Unter den Linden, you notice this extraordinary width that is somewhat like the Champs Elysees in Paris, isn't it? It has sort of that feeling. And, and so that all of a sudden, with the width alone, you know, that, uh, you know that you are in a posh neighborhood, that you are en route to power, to the palace itself. So both the trees and the width are means of signifying relationships of power itself. Now I notice that we are walking very nicely down Unter den Linden to Friedrichstrasse. And perhaps at Friedrichstrasse, Katinka may be able to get a view of one of the stoplights, if not, Stu, I know, has some beautiful images of that world-famous icon of Berlin. Yeah, <laughs> the famous Ampelmann. The word Ampel is German for stoplight. And the man is that figure, that icon, that informs us of whether we can walk or not walk. There it is. The, and that's it. We're going to cross. And you notice that this design is actually quite cute, actually. Now, let's think a little bit about this. The, all these things that need to be unified post-1990 and unification, the canalization, the street names, the iconologies of the two separate Berlins, communist street names being replaced by uh, 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 poets or whatever the case may actually be, the uh, public transport routes, the electricity lines, that all has to be unified. And what also needs to be unified is the stoplights. West Germany, West Berlin had their own ample man, and East Germany from 1976 had a very beautiful, its own ample man. And post-1990, you notice there's a big souvenir store here, Ampelmann. This indicates to you how powerful this icon really is. And post-1990, the, 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 stop, the stoplights of the former East Germany, East Berlin were removed and replaced with the West German design, which by no means so, I'll use the word cute or even benign. And the East Germans said, no, one thing that we need is our Ampelmann. And now what is happening is the Ampelmann, that really rather, rather adorable um, icon allowing you to walk or not allowing you to walk, more protective somehow, is, uh, is now not only in 
back, they've replaced them now back here in all of Berlin, but now all of Germany is beginning to use the Ampelmann of East Germany. And that means something. In terms of East Germany as a geopolitical entity and a, uh, uh, I'll say, communist society, there's really only two things that give us memory to this. And that is number one, the Ampelmann, and number two, the, the, the Trabant, the Trabi. I don't think we'll see a Trabi along the way if, if Katinka actually, sees actually, one. Actually, so, Tom, I'll, Tom yeah. there's, there's yeah. some in that uh, photo of the um, People's Palace, so they can see Ooh. it in the foreground. They're the Trabis. Uh, oh, there's the Trabis. Oh, look at the Trabis. Yeah. They're gorgeous. <laughs> they too give us the memory of East Germany. Now, at the corner of Friedrichstrasse, where I began to talk about Umf Ampelmann, we could have also referred to Friedrichstrasse as a new downtown, which it is. The, and that new downtown on Friedrichstrasse is coming in the history of a theater district. Friedrichstrasse is where the great theaters of Berlin were situated, where Kurt Weill, Bertolt Brecht, premiered the Three Penny Opera, where the cabarets are situated, the Chat Noir, Schal and Rauch. And related to that theater district is this building just behind me here. I'll stand here, Katin, and then they'll see it behind me, just behind me. Rather dull looking from the exterior, from the interior, a beautiful neo-rococo extravaganza. This is the Komische Oper, the comic opera, which maintains itself as ballet and opera to this day. And I point this out not only in terms of that history of the, uh, of the theater in Berlin, but this is where the great Australian stage director and artistic producer, Barry Kosky, works here in Berlin. And just so you're all aware of that, he's very beloved in Berlin. When he arrived, he did a very beautiful Rose and Cavalier. We continue down. Oh, oh, Katinka, we're going to get ourselves killed here. We better get over. The Ampelmann just turned red and it was not benign. The <laughs> We continue to walk down the brand to, towards the Brandenburg Gate on Unterdain Linden. Now, as we approach the Brandenburg Gate, we are going to be walking by a very large, rather monumental building. And this is today the Russian Embassy. What was, from 1956 onwards, the Soviet Union Embassy. Now, the, so the, Rus the Russian Empire had its embassy to, to the German Empire at this position here. So, post oh, I think Stuart has, oh, great, Stuart has a beautiful image of that. Thank you, Stuart. The, and so, post-1949 and the creation of East Germany as an independent sovereign republic, the Soviet Union is able to build their enormous embassy at this point. Now, if you are looking at the image that Sue has thrown up against, as has created for us, you notice that there's a Belvedere to the building. If you look at some of the details, you will notice the Grecian columns. You will notice the rusticated ground floor, um, uh, detail works of the lanterns, all taking their formulations from antique Greece, suggesting that the Soviet Union and its affiliated countries are the heirs of the humanism of the Grecian world. However, both the size and the proportions and the thickness of the decorative element creates a rather authoritarian architecture as well. And this architecture, which was promoted by Stalin, is sometimes referred to as the Stalin Baroque, creating palaces, but palaces for the workers. Today, it is, as I suggested, the embassy of today's Russia. Now, this building was like a microcosm of, of a Soviet urban environment. Working in the embassy, where it's given, we're up to 2,000 people. And housed to a certain extent in this building, and housed at a building just behind, so I should say to the posterior of this building, creating then, as I suggested, a Soviet Union enclave um, in then the former 
East Berlin, East Germany. You notice even here, as, as Katinka does these images, look at the fencing here, the protective security system. It's really quite beautiful. But you notice that the Grecian elements that we see are a little bit thicker. They, they lose a little bit of the, 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 the line of the antique world. Beautiful in itself, but a little bit heavier, um, a little bit more authoritarian. Perfect. Great. We continue to stroll down Unter den Linden, which is something the Berliners love to do. Approaching the Brandenburg Gate. Now, oh, as can, can I just? Yeah. So, sorry. So someone just asked. Um, obviously, it's now the Russian embassy. It was the yeah. Soviet embassy. Yeah. Um, but what happened during the First World War and the Second World War when basically Germany and Russia were enemies? Was it still there as an embassy? It was still there as an embassy. That's a good question, Sue, and thank you for asking it. With the outbreak of the conflict between Germany, em Empire Germany and Empire Russia, World War I, then the diplomatic relations stop. But the building physically exists. But after or during the course of World War II, and I believe, Stu, you might have an image that you can either show now or perhaps later of 1945 Berlin from the Brandenburg Gate outwards. And this, the embassy, the historic embassy, was actually damaged heavily in the course of World War II. The, and post-World War II, yeah. Yeah. then the Soviet Union removes the ruins of the, of the historical embassy and rebuild them in this Stalin Baroque means that we are able to see so nicely on that building. The, oh, there you go. Yeah. So, oh, oh, there's our Berlin bear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Well, what is this Brandenburg Gate? The Brandenburg Gate, which is the icon of Berlin, was simply a gate within the city wall. That's all it was. It was a very important gate as it led to the processional boulevard of Unter den Linden and thus to the palace. And in 1790, the then king of Prussia, Fat Billy, told his architect to renew the gate, to rebuild it, to rejuvenate the gate, to make a more appropriate and elegant um, entrance to the royal city of Berlin. There it is. There you have a beautiful historical image of the Brandenburg Gate itself. Oh, look at all those people doing their promenade. <laughs> and today, actually, the Brandenburg Gate looks just as, in, as, is, as it is in this image. Now, before we get closer to the gate, I noticed that Kantinka is turned on again, and she's pointing her camera towards Berlin's premier hotel, the Hotel Adlon which dates historically from the beginning of the 20th century, 1904. All the great visitors to Berlin stayed at this hotel. I'm certain Stu will show you a few more photos or images concerning that. The building was damaged in the course of World War II, and eventually the ruins are totally removed to be rebuilt on its historical position in the late 1990s. One of the first buildings to return to a new Berlin, but to maintain that historical uh, context and connotation. Now, Sue, I'm going to hand over to you, if that's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you still with us, Tom? I'm still there. Yeah, yeah, oh, I see. Still going. yeah, that's all right. Okay, great. Tell you what. So I'm going to go down to the Brandenburg Gate. I'll talk all about the gate. And before we leave the gate, then let's go back to the Hotel Adlon. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah sure. Well, just, just as you're walking down the gate, I've shown a couple of images of the hotel. And I had a good image of the modern exterior. And then you obviously mentioned how anybody who was anybody has stayed at the Adlon Hotel. Kings, queens, princes, uh, presidents, whatever. Um, but... There's one sort of famous person who stayed and made a bit of a stir when he did stay there. Um, and we're going to really go downtown on this one. Um, the pop star Michael Jackson, who very famously hung his child Prince um, out the window <laughs> at the balcony of, of his suite. 
<laughs> Sorry, I've got a little bit lowbrow for you, Tom, but I can't help myself. But, um, let's go. Yeah. Perfect. But isn't that a joyful event? I don't know if it was yeah, a joyful. The baby <laughs> nearly slipped out of the hands of, of <laughs> Mr. Okay. Jackson. But, but it does indicate to us after all this trauma, cataclysmic events, the turbulence that is so exemplified via the history of the Brandenburg Gate and the proximity to the Hotel Adlon, that there's a return of that which is the joyful. And I think perhaps that's one of the great elements of today's Berlin. So I'm walking behind me is the Hotel Adlon, and I'm just going to swing up on ahead, and we'll have beautiful views on this lovely day of the Brandenburg Gate. And as I suggested, the gate, oh, gorgeous, gorgeous, thank you. The gate was one of 17 gates within the city wall of Berlin. The city wall ran parallel to the gate. Now you see that when the king uh, executed the gate, that, his, that he told his architects, make certain it reminds people of the entrance to the Acropolis in Athens, the, the Prophylaean. As you look at the gate, you notice that the architect utilizes the Grecian Doric. He creates then two wings to the building, a glyptotake and a pinacotake, so that as you entered into Berlin, you were entering into a new Athens. Said idea continued on then later with Museum Island, for instance. And when the building was completed, the king called up a friend of his named Shadow to do the world famous quadriga on top. The four horses pulling the goddess Irene in her chariot, the goddess of prosperity towards the palace itself. The, in 1806, Napoleon occupied Berlin and he comes through that center opening that you see so nicely today. Oh, there's a lovely view of the quadriga. And he, and Napoleon steals the quadriga. Typical Napoleon, whenever that man saw a horse statue, he stole it. <laughs> <laughs> And this is due to the fact that, for example, here, the Quadriga, it had become an organizational point in the city, not only physically organizing the city, but also organizing identity to the city and to the kingdom of Prussia. And so the Berliners were devastated when this was removed. It returned in 1815 and remounted. And at that moment, the king of Prussia, Billy's son, mounts... Uh, 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 gives into the hands of Irene the Iron Cross, the Medal of Honor and Bravour of the Prussian army, so that prosperity becomes victory as well. Now, doing what we are doing, Katinka and I are in East Berlin. We remain, as have you, all of you, soundly and per firmly within the Soviet sector of Berlin. We are in East Berlin. And doing what we are doing, Katinka is just doing a panorama of the further buildings around here. Um, and what we are doing, standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate on the East Berlin side, would have been quite dangerous for us from 1961 to 1989. As, as in 1961, the Berlin Wall goes up. And from where we are situated, the Berlin Wall went up behind the Brandenburg Gate and parallel to the, more or less parallel to the gate. And I know that Stuart will eventually yeah. have an image for you. Yeah, there it is. It. And you notice that where the Brandenburg Gate is, there's a space of land, and then you see the Berlin Wall. This space, this land, this strip, is referred to as the death strip, the murder strip. And the murder strip was then closed down by a second wall. The second wall ran closer to the Hotel Adlon, parallel to the Berlin Wall itself, and so more or less where, where that pointer now is, but a little bit further over. It's not quite, yeah, there is a bit of it. And so that from 1961 to 1989, the Brandenburg Gate was packed between those two walls. It was on the death strip. Now, when Billy in 1790 told his architect it must remind people of Athens, the entrance to the Acropolis, the Prophylaean, it's important to keep in mind or to be cognizant of the fact that by so doing, he was ordering his architect to create a symbolic of democracy. As in particular, the Prophylaean and the Parthenon in Athens were when built with their proportional and scaling systems, a means of communicating this new societal system developed in Athens. So democracy and humanism. And Billy did this intentionally as a result of the French Revolution. He's aware of what's going on in France. 
and to prevent the revolution from coming to Berlin and Prussia, he created a series of societal reforms. He communicates these via every aesthetic device possible, music, art, gardens, uh, and most poignantly, the Brandenburg Gate, the entrance to a new Athens. And so when that wall goes up and the Brandenburg Gate finds itself on the death strip, it loses that symbolic language. It cannot possibly symbolic, uh, 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 determine itself as democratic. It can only make a reference to the desecration of democracy in an authoritarian regime. And this begins to explain the relevance of the Brandenburg Gate to this day. We see via Katinka's lovely images, well, today it's not so bad, but <laughs> the people are here. There's no museum here. There's no shopping mall here. There's the Brandenburg Gate, a space, an identity, a focus point to memory and the communication of democracy. Now, one thing that is definitely not democratic on the Brandenburg Gate, oh, thank you, Katinka, these are beautiful images. You notice that there are five openings to the gate. And Katinka and I are going to walk through the center opening as you all should when you come to Berlin. The center opening is much wider than the two on either side, and it's visibly wider. It's considerably wider. And this was intentional. It's non-Grecian, as the center opening was reserved for the royal family. So, <laughs> so, so make certain to do your entrance and your exit of Berlin royally, please. And, and associated then, due to this memory, there are a series of events that occur that strengthen this identity to the Brandenburg Gate throughout, in particular, the 20th century. And I and Katinka, we're just going to cross over here to the lovely Tiergarten. You'll see that in a few minutes. But I'm going to turn over to Stuart, who has a series of images utilizing, for instance, that center opening. And, um, and by so doing, oh, lovely views, yeah. views yeah. again by Katinka. I'm going to hand over to Stuart. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Um, obviously, Tom and Katinka aren't the first people to walk through the Brandenburg Gate, uh, one of the more famous images, um, Adolf Hitler on his, in his motorcade. It was actually on his way out to the opening of the 1936 Summer Olympics, made famous by Jesse Owens winning the five gold medals, much to the horror of the Joseph Goebbels. Um, and again, using that central arch, that royal extra wide arch. We saw the image um, during the Cold War with the Berlin Wall where the Brandenburg Gate was stuck out in the middle. But just before that, at the end of World War II, uh, after the Battle of Berlin, when the Soviets um, defeated the Nazi forces, uh, the damage that was done to Berlin. And there's a great image there of the Brandenburg Gate and looking up Unter der Linden where we've just walked down um, and the damage that was done. And then even at the end of the war, tourists still came to Berlin, the Soviet soldiers taking photos at the Brandenburg Gate. But you can see the damage that was done, the phenomenal amount. During the period before the Berlin Wall went up, so from 1948, 49 through to 1961, the city was still divided. The, Allied, the three Allies controlled West Berlin and the Soviet Union controlled East Berlin. And there was a, a border, but the Brandenburg Gate, you could actually still walk through it. And here we have, this was the, the border crossing, basically a sign saying, hey, you're about to cross, you're about to leave West Berlin, don't do it. Um, and then you're going through the Brandenburg Gate. But obviously, 1961, the Berlin Wall went up. Yes, it's um, yeah, and, yeah. and then, um, Famously, John F. Kennedy visited Berlin um, after the war went up. So 1962, he visited Berlin and he made his famous speech, the Ich bin ein Berliner, um, but basically cementing the society. This was a bastion of Western democracy here in West Berlin and it's always going to be uh, committed to defend it. And quite interestingly, you can see how these Germans put red banners down between the gates of the Brandenburg Gate to hide the view so he couldn't see up Unter den Linden. You then, the next famous speech there is Ronald Reagan, when he came and made his speech in uh, 1988, basically saying, Mr. Gorbachev, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And basically it was a symbol of the Cold War and trying to say, end this Cold War, we don't want this wall here. And of course, that famous night in November, 1989, 
when the wall did actually come down, um, I think I said at the very beginning, it was a bit of a bureaucratic schmozzle. The East German government had announced that they were lifting travel restrictions and it was at a press conference and someone asked, well, when? From when? And the poor guy who was making the announcement, he had no idea. And he's shuffling around, you can see him looking, going, oh, he just went now. And all of a sudden, people just flooded to the border crossings. And the guards just let them through. And here are people on top of the Berlin Wall outside the Brandenburg Gate. One of the great images, I think, of the 20th century. Um, and then we'll continue on to Tom. Um, looking down, as they're walking through the tear garden, if they had looked straight at head down the avenue of 7th of June, right in the far distance, they would have seen this victory column, which is a major focal point of West Berlin um, and now of Berlin. But uh, there, to Tom, going to the tear garden. Yep. See if I can get uh, an idea for everyone. Exactly. Oh, gorgeous. Yep, I'll just give an image here. Um, just give you an idea, um, an aerial view of Berlin. Um, we were just here at the Brandenburg Gate and we had come down Unter der Linden, the Brandenburg Gate. We're heading over to the Reichstag building, but you can actually see the size of this tear garden, this royal hunting ground um, and the avenue of 17th of June leading That's down right. to where that victory column was. And then, so, and then, so again, aerial views, the Brandenburg Gate, Tom and Katina walking through the tea garden, heading out to in front of the Reichstag building. Over to you, Tom. Great. Thank you, Stu, for that and that lovely visit to the tea garden. I'm just going to, very briefly, before we get to the Reichstag, I'd like to point out one last memorial position here in Berlin. Just very briefly, I'm here in the shade. Um, I'll come out. The, in 1933, this relates to the Reichstag, which is the parliamentary building then and now. In 1933, on the 26th of February, there was a large fire in the Reichstag. Adolf Hitler has been chancellor for 30 days, but when he was chosen chancellor on the 30th of January, 1933, he did not have a majority in the parliament. So, he called for new elections, which were to be held and were held on March 5th, 33. But one week before that election, on the 26th of February, the Reichstag interior burns out. And ensuing upon that is a declaration of emergency. And Hitler is given enormous emergency powers into his own hands. He allowed then the elections to go forth. And in spite of his efforts, blaming the fire upon the left wing, saying this is the beginning of a Bolshevist revolution, 94 communist or socialist politicians are elected or re-elected into the parliament. Using those emergency powers, which are never revoked, Hitler was able to charge these politicians on grounds of sedition and treason. They're all found guilty thereof of owing their allegiance to the Soviet Union, and many will eventually die in the concentration camp system. And in 1994, just immediately in front of the Reichstag, the state of Berlin created a memorial to these left-wing politicians. And if we look at one of them, you notice here what looks like slates. Katinka is doing a beautiful panorama for us. These, this slate, it's actually iron. But let's take a look, and maybe we can find one. Which one is good, uh, Katinka? Maybe Julius Rosenmann here? I can see the name Julius. Oh, then let's find any of them. Which one? Ernst Scheppenhorst? You notice here the name Ernst Schneppenhorst. He was born in 19, uh, 1881, and he died in 18. In 1945, so just probably days, or maybe at the very end of World War II, in a prison here in Berlin. There are one slate for each politician. So a very individualized memorial process, which again becomes part of this matrix of memory that is so relevant to an understanding of today's Berlin. Now before we talk a little bit more about the Reichstag itself, let's take a look at the new government buildings. They are beautiful. They're new since 2000. 
they are actually beautiful. And you may ask yourself at one point, where does Mrs. Miracle work? <laughs> Mrs. Miracle works and could choose to live in the chancellery. And the chancery is this beautiful, rather large building. And I can see it now in Katinka's images in the white concrete with the glass and the Diocletian window, that half that semicircle window. This is the chancellery. And you will notice immediately that it formulates a rhythm, that there's a, a reduction of the monumentality via the rhythm of the glass and the concrete, the glass, steel, and concrete, that then carries on to the offices of the members of parliament. And this is, oh, if you take a look, Stuart's going to show an image for us. And if you look at the image, where the pointer is, that's the chancellery, that's where Mrs. Miracles, you notice also extends well beyond uh, what we see or what we have seen from uh, our views here. And then it continues eastwards to the building that has the pointer now, and this is the offices of the members of parliament. You notice that it is on a beautiful east-west axial, and the building maintains itself then with the white concrete and the glass and steel. And what we will not be able to see once, uh, so it's nice to have this image, beyond there's a third building, exactly where the pointer is now, and that is the congressional library. And all maintaining itself within glass, steel, and concrete in white. So that eventually I formulate a tripartite system that with the glass becomes one, as the glass is a means of unifying each building into one at the same time proclaiming the transparency to the governmental process. This is called the band of the federal government. And it introduces us very nicely to the parliament building itself. The German parliament is called the Bundestag. Bund is federal and Tag is parliament, but specifically a Tag is a diet, so a unicameral legislature. And today's Bundestag is housed in the historical building, which is so beautiful. I'm going to come a little bit more here, uh, can take a little bit more central maybe. And, um, and that historical building is the Reichstag. The word Reich is empire, Tag is diet or parliament. And the Reichstag building is again a wonderful example of that imperial architecture that we began with. Looking back into the Renaissance, the Baroque for one's architectural information, creating a dome to the building. And uh, there's a beautiful historical view of it. So again, with a dome, a symbolic of power. The building opened in 1892. Now, not too terribly much happened in the Reichstag until that infamous fire of the 26th of February, 1933. And there you see the dome is on fire. The interior will eventually collapse, leaving the building in ruin, essentially, but with the exterior walls still existing. And in 19, there it is. In 1945, the Soviets take Berlin essentially single-handedly in the Battle of Berlin, which is last days of April and first days of May in 1945. And just, this is a remake, by the way, this famous photo is a reenactment of the hoisting of the Soviet flag on the Reichstag, which is 10 minutes to midnight on the 30th of April, 1945 to the 1st of May. That's bringing a practical end of World War II in Europe. On the 2nd of May, 45, there's the, uh, a ceasefire, and then on the 8th of May, the capitulation. The building, as this symbolic of essentially democracy that is again desecrated via the results of the fire, um, maintains an enormous memory position. Now, when we crossed under the Brandenburg Gate and Katika and I arrived in the Tiergarten, we transferred from East Berlin, Soviet sector, to West Berlin. And we are now in the British sector. And the Reichstag was also in the British sector. And it was remodeled. There you see it after the World War II. And it was remodeled. This is the, this is the 1960s. Utilized as a museum of German history in the West Berlin and also to a certain extent, governmental purposes. It is in this building that on the 3rd of October, 19, 3rd of October, 1990, that the East and the West Parliament meet and convene and vote on unification. East Germany from that moment forward no longer exists. We are a unified nation and a unified city. The building, in one year later, they vote to move the, the parliament from Bonn 
to Berlin. And they choose the Reichstag with its historical connotations as the new home of the Bundestag. The building is given to Norman Foster to do a remodeling. But before Foster begins his work, the German government allowed Jean-Claude and Christo to wrap the Reichstag. Look how beautiful, oh, that was beautiful. It was the summer of 1994, absolutely beautiful. The color patterns that were being created on this aluminum-like fabric. And when the wrappings came down, the work begins. As if that wrapping by Christo and Jean-Claude was like a cocoon, a protective element that then allows a new life, a renovation, rejuvenation to occur, resulting in today's Reichstag, which is the historical building remodeling the interior with that magnificent glass dome. And I know that Stu has some beautiful images of the glass dome itself. There it is. Glass of transparency, glass that amalgamates the architecture and the persons within the architecture. That's you. As we are allowed to go into that dome, suggesting the power of the individual in a representational democracy, but at the same time with that glass, which does not create compositional closure, the charisma of the ideals of democracy throughout the world. So with that said, I and Katinka would love to thank Stu for a beautiful early afternoon here in Berlin as we've explored Berlin in really quite a few facets and ideas, bringing us from the 18th century to the 21st century, examining how memorials work in Berlin, creating that matrix, as I've suggested, one with the city. But at the same time, um, to a certain extent, examining how these layers of history are communicated by visuals and architecture. To a certain extent, focusing on Berlin as a city whose architecture communicates democracy. So with all of that said, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. 